2023 12th and city council meeting. I'll go ahead and call this meeting in to session. And we'll go ahead and start off with the Pledge of Allegiance tonight, led by Octavio, our <laughs> Councilor Gonzalez. <laughs> All right, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Councilor Gonzalez. Our first item under announcements is the 12th in the Science and Technology Scholarship Award today led by Councilor Hillier. Thank you very much. Uh, we welcome up uh, Kelly and her dad, Miguel. No, her dad's gonna stay back. I'm gonna stay back there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Need to start. Sorry. Okay, we didn't. We didn't practice. Okay. <laughs> We're just so happy to have you here, Kelly, uh, and such a great audience to get to see how incredibly bright the future really is with people like you in it, Kelly. All right, 2023 Twalton Science and Technology Scholarship winner. It is my pleasure and honor to announce the Twalton Science and Technology Scholarship winner for the 2023 school year. This year, the city is awarding one one thousand dollar scholarship. And this scholarship recipient is Kelly Tejada Castellanos. Choosing one student to receive a scholarship was very difficult because each of the students who applied were outstanding. Not only did each one have impressive grades, but they had also been involved in many kinds of extracurricular activities and volunteer work in the community. It was inspiring to see the applications of so many intelligent, hardworking, and community-oriented young people who live here in Tualatin, truly, truly. Kelly lives with her uncle, Miguel, in Tualatin and just graduated from Tualatin High School. She was born in the United States. Kelly spent most of her life in Mexico, returning to America after the COVID-19 pandemic impacted her education. At Tualatin High School, she completed her coursework while simultaneously learning English. Kelly's vision is to become a high school physics teacher. Can you imagine? <laughs> Isn't that inspiring, right? <laughs> She cites being inspired by her Twalton physics teacher, Mr. Chris Murray. If you know Mr. Murray, you know that that is a very likely thing. In her scholarship application, Kelly said that she wants to teach future student, students, particularly those who speak a language other than English, how to analyze and solve problems in a fun, engaging, and empathetic way, right? We all know physics to be empathetic. <laughs> Kelly's letters of recommendation described her as inquisitive, compassionate, driven, and intelligent, a student who loves learning and who loves helping others. Kelly was a member of the Language and Culture Club at Tualatin High School, serving as a teacher's assistant, teaching assistant. At the school she previously attended in Mexico, Kelly participated in dance club and volleyball club. She has also been active in community volunteerism, including participating in the Interact Club of Mexico. She wants to study physics at Oregon State University and will be the first in her family to attend college. I shouldn't say go ducks right there, huh? <laughs> <laughs> the scholarship committee consists of myself, Counselor Sacco representing the, uh, for the council, uh, Bunko Camus of Pacific Metal Company representing the Tualatin Chamber of Commerce and Director Jill Zerschmied representing the Tiger Tualatin School Board. The criteria considered in selecting scholarship recipients include academic standing, field of study, extracurricular activities, and community activities. We are happy and honored to recognize Kelly's many achievements and are pleased to be able to help her reach her academic goals. Congratulations. And Kelly has a few words she'd like to say, if that'd be okay. Uh, yeah, I just... I want to say thank you for this opportunity, but also for your patience, because as you know, I went to Carvales to attend my orientation at Oregon State, and we just get here, and, you know, I think in no time, and yeah, I just I want to read something if you want, yeah, okay, um, I'm going to say I'm honored to be one of the recipients of this year, and of the Toiletine Science and Technology Scholarship, 
And when I would like to take this opportunity to personally thank each of you and for helping make it possible for me to achieve my goal of going to college. And your contribution to my education is generous and much appreciated for me. And thanks to your donation, I'm able to continue to focus on my studies. And I hope that one day I will be able to give something back to those who have assisted me to achieve my dreams. And as you know, I'm still learning English and I hope, you know, get a good <laughs> level on that. And yeah, just I'm going to say thank you. And I doing my best. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. I know Megan, Megan wants to do a photo. So how about Chelsea Hill, you go, you out, go out front here, a little group back here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We actually have uh, everybody spread out so they're on yeah. either side of the three in the front. Oh, so yeah, so move this way. There we go. <laughs> A little bit further, Council President. There we go. <laughs> All right. Maybe we can move this this way a little bit. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. All right. Best wishes in Corvallis. Yeah. <laughs> I, str I struggled with physics, so more power to you. <laughs> okay, that brings us to item number two in announcements. The Tualatin Community Emergency Response Team, otherwise known as CERT, Emergency Preparedness Fair. I think this is Kathy. Good evening. Are we on? Yeah, you're on. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, Madam President, Council Members. I'm very pleased to be here tonight in the announcement section. Um, as a beaver, I'm also <laughs> I couldn't be happier to follow this very, very um, outstanding high school student who's going to my school, and I think she'll do us proud. So congratulations to her. Tonight, we're going to give you an overview of our August 5th emergency fair. Uh, tonight's presenter is Heather Slocker. She's the director of our membership. Heather is a recent uh, resident of Tualatin, but she's hit the ground running. She's in the uh, Midwest CIO, and she is also on our board. And all of the creative stuff came from others, and a lot of it came from Heather. So Heather, you're on, go for it. Great. Thank you, Welcome. Kathy. Thank you all for having us here tonight. Um, we have a PowerPoint presentation to share with you. Um, so I'm Heather, thank you for the nice introduction. And um, really been enjoying my short time in Tualatin and joined CERT last year and then, um, yeah, thank you. The, Forgot there's about that. millions. Watching on channel 28. Uh, the pressure's on. Um, and then I found out that we're having this emergency preparedness fair and they asked me to help out with marketing. And so I've been kind of doing a little bit of work and we got the brochures and everything updated in English and in Spanish for CERT. And then we started creating ads and everything for the um, emergency fair, which is August 5th. And we have a new logo and a new cute little bee um, mascot. And he's got his little cert helmet on and his glasses and everything. And so we've been pasting this guy everywhere we go. And 
We also have been working with Michael over at Tualatin Life, and we uh, created this ad with his, a lot of his help here. And we are working on hanging up these around town and putting them at the library and Starbucks and Fred Meyer and whoever else will let us hang it up. And it's got a list of all the exhibitors and so forth. And um, we also have had two articles written about the fair. Well, one's coming out in July and one came out last month. So maybe you, maybe you caught it already. Um, and then here are the details. So the, it'll be on a Saturday from 11 to three. The admission is free. We have lots of giveaways and prizes, including we're going to hand out 200 little go bags, um, probably to kids mostly, but it'll be a little um, drawstring backpack with the little B logo on it. And then as they troop around the fair, they're going to be able to go and visit all the booths and pick up little fun items like, you know, pens and flashlights and whistles and so forth. And in fact, we've got um, the Tualatin neighborhood ready people are going to do some little whistles with the bees and then some other people are going to be handing out flashlights with bees and then to make it extra fun we're going to do like a little passport adventure for them so each booth they go to they get a little sticker and then it's also trying to encourage them to go and visit lots of people because we we have the city of Tualatin plus um rest fire rescue and police and utilities and everybody so maybe some of them they wouldn't be all that excited about but now they get a sticker and at the end when they come back they'll get a helmet as their prize that's going to have the 12 to be on it so we're going to have all these cute little kids running around with whistles we're going to give them puppies too maybe puppies and a lot of sugar because kona ice is going to be there handing out snow cones so it's going to be super fun so i was joking about the puppies no puppies um but I think at this point we have more than 35 exhibitors and um, expert speakers will be going on the whole time at the Juanita Pole Center and all the information is very graciously updated by Kathy on the website. Um, the American Red Cross is going to be doing their pillowcase project, which is really amazing. It was a little bit tough to get them out, but we figured out how to make it work and we've got, um, they're actually giving out these pillowcases and they're super heavy duty and they teach kids um, from grades three to five about how to be prepared and to make their own little go bag. They get to go home with this and that's something they can keep under their bed with their favorite stuffed animal and some snacks and a flashlight. And it should be really great. And a helmet and a whistle. No um, puppy. This is the little passport adventure where we've, it's going to, it's the bee theme again. So it's going through the hive is going to visit all the exhibitors and get their little stickers to get their prize at the end. Oh, and we also created a QR code. So people that are younger than us can use their phones, <laughs> scan it and go right to the website. Um, so here's some of the exhibitors. We have some big ones like Costco and Mud Bay. Mud Bay is going to be handing out little snacks and talking about how to get prepared for your animals. If there was a disaster, what you should do. Um, and we've got Go State Kits is going to be doing a raffle and giving away some go bags. We've got the ham radio team out with their solar powered radio station and antennas. And so they'll be doing little demonstrations on how to use the, the walkie talkie and um, a lot of utilities. And um, then we've got local businesses as well. So we're really excited to be able to support some of them. And they're going to be all handing out really cool little goodies to put in the go bags as as people go around and um, oh and Kona Ice too we've got the Kona Ice truck is going to be there and then these are the speakers there's um, BJ Cure is going to be out talking about how to get your house quake proof and so he does assessments and then gives people ideas about what they can do to improve their own home American Red Cross will also be doing a, a workshop for adults and teens followed by the pillowcase project for the little kids at the end. And this will all be in the Juanita poll. And these are, um, seating is limited. So we need people to sign up ahead of time to reserve a seat. So I think it's 25, 25. We've got yard signs we're gonna start hanging up around the neighborhood. So you're gonna see those popping up because we're getting them tomorrow. And um, Kathy and her buddy with a drill will be out maybe in your neighborhood, <laughs> give them a wave. And then we've also got a big banner coming that's going to be um, hung up at that intersection with Martinazzi. And uh, we'll hang that up a week before the fair. So we can encourage everybody to come out. And we hope you all come out. Um, and we really appreciate all the help that the city has been giving us to make this actually possible. 
So we're really excited, really excited. Yeah, this is uh, uh, understated. Lindsay Marshall has been wonderful. City of Tualatin's been wonderful. The parks people have been wonderful. Julie and Heidi have been wonderful. But the whole bee concept came from Tualatin being a bee city. And so we grabbed on to your bee and she gave it a flashlight and safety glasses and a helmet. So we yeah. wanna wanna thank thank you. We would really appreciate it as our elected officials, if you're in town on August 5th, that's a Saturday, if you could come by, that would be a, a very nice thing. I know it's a busy time of year, yeah. but bring your kids. Or puppies. No. Yeah. Kidding puppies. <laughs> I'll tell you, we're gonna have a lot of kids. Whistles are very important for safety. That's part of what we teach kids is have a whistle. So if you need help, you can whistle. But I don't think that's why they're going to be whistling on Saturday. Probably no, not. No. Yeah. Anyway, so thank you to the city of Tualatin yeah. and the city staff. They've been fantastic. Yeah. Thank you much. Questions for the CERT folks? Dr. Gonzalez. I want to say thank you very much for putting this together. This is very well organized, put together. I, I'm definitely going to post this in our community website um, at the Fox Hills, and, and hopefully we can get a good attendance because this looks to be a, a lot of fun. And with current times, this is very relevant, specifically right now. So thank you so much for putting this together. And I'll definitely will be there with my family as well. Great. Great. And I can get more posters and flyers, too, if any, any of you want to hand them out somewhere. So hmm? just let me know. Will you be able to distribute some in Spanish? I yeah, please? we have uh, we do we do we have um, we got our brochure printed in Spanish, and we have the same little flyers this this one in we, Spanish as well. We'll be handing it out at Viva Tualatin at Viva Tualatin next week. Yeah, we'll have a booth there again, thanks to the city. All right. Anything else? Where's the press? Just really quick, thank you for all the work. I know it's all volunteer work, and it's so important to help people be ready for the inevitable. So thank you. Well, thank you both for coming tonight. And this looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to be out of town, unfortunately. So yeah, I can't take it. it's a busy time. Yeah. Well, we're hoping to have this more than just this one time, maybe a yeah. year or yeah. frequently. Yeah, so. we, we've we spent a lot on signs. and <laughs> <laughs> Got to reuse them. Well, we've already, you know, discussed how we could cover up the date and yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank Thanks. you all. Thank you. All right. That brings us to public comment. Uh, public comment is an opportunity for anyone to address the city council regarding an item that's not on tonight's agenda. Please keep your comments to about three minutes. Uh, if there's anyone here who would like to address the council, this would be the appropriate time. I do have some folks signed up. I'm going to start with, is there anybody in Zoom that is public comment? All right. So we'll start with the signups. And the first up is uh, Mr. Drangsholt. Welcome. Yes, sir. I think you might recognize me from about a month ago. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, Madam President, and counselors, thank you for the time. I have uh, five people in support of what I'm about to talk about. And I don't know if you're aware, but over 25 restaurant organizations have closed in Washington County and Clackamas County this year. It's still affecting the industry. It's affecting those that also are music venues. Half the music venues in Portland area have closed. And that was since the pandemic started. We're all looking for ways to earn more income and support the overhead that we have in our buildings. I did send you an email with three panels of where I'm talking about putting pickleball courts. And if you would like to see a close up of this, I'd be more than happy to hand it to you. About a week and a half ago, two weeks ago on a Monday night, we held what we call the pickleball social to see who would be interested in having us um, build courts behind our very unique location. And I'm here with a um, petition that over 45 people on a Monday came in and signed uh, that said, we would really like to have pickleball at your location. 
And I think that I could probably get 700 people here at the council meeting. Let's not do that. <laughs> um, I would like to see if it's possible for the council to help us get it okayed in the zone that we're in and in the unique location that we have behind our building. And behind our building is also train tracks and bushes and over four football fields away from the nearest um, residential area. So the noise is not going to be an issue. The building owner has okayed us to do this renovation if you guys okay it. And I have support of um, a financial person that will be willing to do it and put it in for the good of the nation, if they will, you know. Um, it's very important for the community. It's very important for surrounding businesses who will have increases in gas consumption, we'll get space age right across the street. You know, you know how that builds. And then I'll be able to support my staff by additional hours of labor because we'll be able to open up at eight o'clock in the morning when a lot of these pickleballers want to come in and play. We're not going to be tournament wise because it, you don't have two courts. We want to add two courts and become a tournament. That's not enough, but it will be for very social and communal um, gatherings. And I think it's a real benefit to Tualatin to attract the this population. And I ask for your support. I hope that you all can see that we're genuine and that we want to do it. And it also helps Suzanne get more permits. <laughs> so um, I don't want to take up a lot of your time. If you have any questions for me, I'd be more than happy to answer them. And uh, thank you. I appreciate what your work very much. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Jamie Draxholm. They just donated their time. Oh, donated to, okay. And I, I got so you. I'm not going to sit here for 15 minutes and, Sweet. and, and tell you about All it. Right. I'm just asking for, uh, yep. I believe I, I need at least four of you in support to do so, to move forward. Um, I ask for your vote. All right. Thank you. All right. So we'll circle back to this during, after, uh, if we don't debate it during comment, we can talk about it uh, later tonight uh, after the public hearing. Thank you very much. Sure. Oh, there's more. Okay. So Jamie. So Eric. Right. Eric. All right. Come on up, Eric. Um, I was also here. Once yep. <laughs> yeah. Talk to the mic. Oh, sorry about that. Hi. <laughs> Thanks. I'm Eric Two Rivers. Uh, I'm um, essentially the music director at at, uh, at the garages. Uh, I just have a question, and I don't want it to come off smart alecky or anything. I'm just asking seriously, what more do we need to do to win you over to this idea? So that's that's my question to you tonight for mm -hmm. you to talk about later. And um, I believe that you know how to get a hold of us through Kent and stuff. And so that's that's it. I see it as a win-win for the whole community. It's going to be fun. Okay. And you all are invited to come and partake too. All right. Thanks. Sure. <laughs> all right. Do we have anyone else who would like to come on over, sir? Good evening. I'm Tom Whidden. I'm the president of the Northwest Pickleball Veterans. We're a group of military veterans and established for 11 years now. We travel the West Coast converting old tennis courts and other types of sporting areas into pickleball courts. We've done 93 projects since 2015. I was the leader of the fundraising committee to raise the money to put the lights on Twelton Park. I also personally paid to stripe the original courts there. I bought all of the equipment and the nets that they're now enjoying, not only at Twelton Park, but at Jurgens Park. We also painted the lines up at Ibeck Park. So, one of the things we've been involved in the last couple of years is converting indoor facilities like church gyms and now warehouses. We convert the Best Buy up in Bellingham to nine pickleball courts, and it's a private pickleball club there. This is a big trend. Uh, first of all, it rains a lot here, so you need an indoor place to play outdoors in the, 
and the parks is nice and for about five months for the rest of the time you need a warm indoor place to play and so uh there's been a bunch of that stuff happened in the last six months uh, some uh, bowling alley on 82nd a warehouse up in oregon city uh, there's another job coming up in west lynn we converted nine church gyms and basements into indoor pickleball clubs and these make a lot of money for the the churches and the schools so my own church, uh, Church of the Resurrection, just built a gym and a big pickleball courts there. And these are a nice, fun, fundraising thing. And it really addresses a big problem is what our city is doing for senior citizens in terms of sports. There's plenty of little league and soccer and things of that nature. But what are you doing for senior citizens? The vast majority of pickleball players are senior citizens. I'm pushing 80, but I'm still fairly competitive. But it's something you can do till you just about can't stand up anymore. And uh, if you drove up here, you probably went by Twelton Park. There's 58 people out there playing pickleball right now. So we need more places. Jurgens is filled a lot of times with the people playing when there's not room here. And now we go up to Ibeck Park. I sell portable nets to people so they can take them to other places and, and play too. I also did the pickleball dink courts at the garages for Kent as means of promoting that. We have around 85 military veterans up and down the West Coast that come to our work parties, volunteer their time to make these things happen. So uh, I mentioned we painted the lines over at Twalton Park. But we also raised $4,700 to put the lighting on the courts there. And that's out of our pocket to support pickleball. I mean, you've got a wonderful chance here to support another local indoor place. You already have three outdoor pickleball venues in Tualatin. Uh, you have pickleball going on already indoors at the Bay Club. And we used to play pickleball at 24-hour fitness across the street from the garages. There's plenty of precedents for this event. Um, I think it's about time to kind of say, let's get behind this and help out Mr. Dranghorse and help out the senior citizens. So okay. thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to address the council? All right, seeing none, I'll go ahead and move on to the consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda is uh, those items that are considered routine. They'll be adopted by one motion unless someone on council would like an item removed and heard separately later tonight. Tonight, the consent agenda consists of only three items versus our last meeting. It was like 11 or 12. Uh, item number one, consideration of approval of the work session and regular meeting minutes of June 26, 2023. Item two, consideration of resolution 5714-23 awarding a contract for Stone Ridge Park construction documents and professional services to Pacific Community Design. And finally, item number three, consideration of resolution number 5716-23, awarding the contract for construction to Boonsbury Corridor Phase Two improvements for the Tualta Moving Forward program. Would any uh, council would like an item removed? I move that we adopt the consent agenda as read. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt the consent agenda as read. Any discussion on the motions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? It's unanimous. All right, that brings us to special reports. Uh, item number one, the annual report of the Tualatin Historical Society. Mr. Baker. No, following bees and pickleball, <laughs> it's not gonna be easy. <laughs> And a few uh, future physics teacher too. And a few, yeah, that was amazing, right? <laughs> She's cool. Um, thank you, Mayor, Madam President, City Council, uh, City Manager Lombos. I see that a director of our library is here too. So all kinds of important people. <laughs> Julie also. Um, <clears throat> but my, for me, most important. <laughs> okay, we're going to run through this rather quickly. Please don't hesitate to stop me if there's a question you have, okay? Um, we finally this year have the pandemic in our rear view, 
and I, I Amir, and I, and I say that because all of our meetings have been in person now. And that includes finally in the fall, our Ice Age meetings, which are historically on Thursday evenings, the third Thursday evening every month, they too went to in person. Um, uh, our rentals have picked up. Bad news, we lost Weight Watchers, but we have a lot of other rentals um, that are picking up the pace. And when you see our financials, I think you'll agree we're in good shape there. We have about 400 to 500 visitors per month at the Heritage Center. And um, we have all kinds of things going on with regard to the garden. Um, the oral histories continue. We do about two a quarter. I would like to say every month, but sometimes we skip a month. Mike Lofton from Digipix does those for us. So kudos to him. Uh, we've become more and more focused on our events and I have a special uh, slide on that. And um, I'll talk about fabrics of our lives a little bit later because that was one of our better programs of the year. And we're also proud to host cost-free Tualatin together because that's a very important part of our community. And the other thing I'm gonna brag about in addition to the quilt show was that finally History Day started again for our fourth graders. We renamed it and I'll talk about that. We don't call it um, Pioneer Days anymore. There's an interim name and I'll explain that in just a second. Here's a list of all the things that we did on the art scene this year. I'm not going to go through them. We're proud of them. Um, uh, many of them uh, were done um, cost-free for the performer. And some of them were done in, on a, a, a share, whatever we get at the door cost, to make sure that the um, Mask and Mirrors or Wilsonville players, that they made some money too, as well as us. So it was a win-win situation for us. Um, there's a picture of our historian, Sandra Lafke Carlson, um, a special shout out to her and to Fabric of Our Lives, which was our quilt show. I ran into a lady at my dentist this morning who had actually been to the quilt show. It, we're really, really proud of it. And it's going to become an annual event and look out for it in the spring and come and enjoy. These are all local quilts. And we had a speaker from Portland State University uh, and a lady out of Canby. And it was great. It was just fantastic. Um, Pioneer Day is now at least, for the meantime, History Day. Why? Because we added three things that really don't fold into what you might consider to be pioneer. We had uh, someone speaking about Ice Age, all the erratics that we have on site. We had a speaker there for the kids, a learning module about the native peoples and also the native plants. So... We don't know what we're going to call it in the future, but at least for this year, we just called it History Day because it goes beyond just the pioneers. And we're very proud about that transition that we're making to include those learning modules. Um, also, hats off to Jackie Conan for getting us volunteers. We desperately needed them. We had our own members doing it, but she brought us an additional seven or eight that brought us over the top of the people we really needed to staff those sites and make sure that those fourth graders had a great um, experience. Uh, Mary Rennenbaum, um, she came to us out of the blue, um, taught internationally, has all kinds of credentials working with elementary kids from the United States to Singapore to Germany, all over the world, um, largely in military installations. But um, she brought a, a, a special focus to us that we didn't have before. And guess what was, in my opinion, the kids didn't get to do a survey, but the one-room schoolhouse was a total hit. Who would have thought that fourth graders sitting in front of a school marm that told them not to cross their legs, that told them to be quiet, she separated the boys from the girls. They could only sit down when they were told. They were chided when they picked up their slates too early. And I'm thinking... These are kids that all have iPhones, probably, and the kids love this. It was, it was crazy, but she taught them all kinds of cool things in the one-room schoolhouse that we had there, one of the eight total learning modules that we had, and I had to uh, make sure that I pointed out that kids, maybe kids, but maybe you don't need ki no kids as you think you do. Uh, our financials, this is in the report, if anybody wants to look at it in detail, um, the bottom line is that um, our membership dropped, um, again, second year in a row. Um, that was a disappointment. Um, we're working on that. We have 
um, a new membership person uh, who's going to be helping us. We also have a new volunteer uh, coordinator who's going to be helping us. And anybody who's in a nonprofit here knows that these volunteers are, are like gold. And so we have bright hopes for the future. But when it comes to financials, at least through May and our fiscal year follows the city, we were below budget in terms of our cost and we were above budget in terms of revenue. And I was unable to provide this in time, but that's how we finished the year also. And so financially, we're in great shape. Um, we are really proud of our programming. Uh, we have uh, one a month during the day, first Wednesday of every month at one o'clock at the Heritage Center, and then the third Thursday in the evening also at the Heritage Center, typically, although that does come to the library sometimes. And um, we are grateful that we have TVCTV in our, um, in our corner, and they love to come and to film our programs. And we get those and we put them on our YouTube channel. Yes, the Historical Society has a YouTube channel. And we also put them on our webpage. And so we are actually preserving these events for our archives and for our mission statement for our organization. And there's some examples of what we did at the bottom there. Uh, we're always proud to celebrate who we are. You can go to the TualatinHistory.org. At the top, there's a drop down menu, pick learn and then select celebrate and you'll find these people and you'll learn more about them and why they won the uh, either the Lafke Martinazzi Award or why they won the President's war Award. In short, the Lafke Martinazzi Award are those people who best um, supported our mission statement and the President's Award are for those people who help get um, uh, our, our word out to the community. So read more about these people on our webpage. Here's a young lady, Edwatifi Al Hawani. Uh, you can read more about her also on our webpage, TualatinHistory.org. Select Learn at the top and go down to Celebrate, and you'll find out why she was selected by um, the Historical Society to win the Jack Broom Scholarship. Um, very impressive young lady, um, uh, immigrated here from Iraq, learned Spanish, of course, English, and um, has a lot of other things going on for her, and we're very proud of that. So this is the second to the last foil. This is some unfinished business, things we haven't accomplished that we wanted to, and I'm only going to focus on three things. Only two of them are listed on there. One is we have this Galbraith farm wagon, which was actually uh, restored using a Wainwright. And if you don't know what a Wainwright is, it's basically a person who knows how to historically accurately recover wagons. And this gentleman is one of two people in the Northwest. He happened to be out in the, um, the Dayton area. The other one's in Idaho. So we picked him. And right now it's at Lee's farm. It was on display for a while and um, it's in storage now. We have had conversations with the city and they did find uh, a, a place for us. They were very, the city was very cooperative. Unfortunately, the cost for the shelter, which we had budgeted, didn't meet the, the city standards for shelters. And so we had to go to another plan and we're, that dialogue is still go, going on. So we wanna show this farm wagon, which has been with families that you know, like the Lee family, for example, there's a, the Galbraith family, obviously, because that's what the wagon's named after. Uh, down at the bottom of that list is there is a propeller that is available to us, will be donated to us, that was from the uh, plane crash, uh, military uh, air, airplane that happened uh, in 1952. Um, and that propeller is available to us. We think it would make a really cool display outside. It's aluminum, so it won't rust. At the, at the Heritage Center. We haven't even begun discussions with this yet with, uh, with Ross at the, um, the parks. But there's something new that came up too very recently. At the um, Lake of the Commons, there is um, a water fountain that's the theme for Ice Age. And it, it looks like a bunch of ice blocks st stacked on top of each other. And because it was put there in 1997, a lot of the parts and stuff, and as the city starts to renovate, there for the Veterans Memorial and other things. It, it's just not practical to fit in anymore. But we would love to have that functioning or not over at the Heritage Center. 
including the plaque that's there on the ground. Right now, there's some uh, chain wire fence around it. You can still see it there. But we want to move that to the Heritage Center to continue to recognize those, uh, recognize those people that have um, that funded not only that, but continue to fund efforts uh, Ice Age related in the city, which is important. So uh, those are the three things, two of them are on the list that might be of interest to the city. And then there's the, all the other things that we're doing. Last slide is, of course, us, the, uh, the board, and our manager, Rick uh, Wheelock, if you haven't met him, pop into the Heritage Center. He's, he's a treasure uh, unto himself. And um, I know it's not as good as bees or physics or um, pickleball, but that's what we've been up to. All right. Any questions? Questions for Ross. Council Pratt. Julie, I, I, does this count against my time? Uh, what? <laughs> oh, no, I just wanted to say I've, been, I've worked with Rick a little bit, and he's just wonderful. He's, he's a sweetheart. He's a treasure. Yeah. Other questions? No, I think you, you're doing a great job, Ross. Uh, you keep signing up to be the president of the <laughs> year after year, uh, which I give you credit for, because back when I was on the board, you had some challenges. You know, it's a tough board to work with, but they're Totally devoted, but the very uh, opinionated folks. <laughs> they are. They are. And my 30 years at a German company did nothing to train me to work with the octogenarians that I'm working with now, That's but true. I love them all. Yep. They're, they're, yep. And they're super devoted. Yep. They are. I yep. love them. Yep. And then uh, the one I've been to Mask and Mirror performances in the building, and they, hey. it, it, it works. It works. In it the works. Yeah. It's great. Keep your eye out. Go to our webpage and look at our calendar. It's right on the homepage and see what we have, what programs we have coming up. There's a, a show on right now and um, I don't know, 10 bucks, whatever it is to get in and you see a great show. And um, what you else? want to promote your event in September? Give a plug. What's happening in September? The annual. Oh, the, oh yeah. <laughs> On, on on the uh, I'm sorry, thank you, thank you, Mayor. On the on the eighth, on Friday, the eighth of September, we have our annual, our only fundraiser of the year, actually, um, and it is our Heritage Evening. And we last couple of years we had Tom Swear Engine, uh, Oregon. Uh, he's won uh, Western Cowboy Poetry of all kinds of awards. Um, this year we're changing it up a little bit, and we have a local guy. Um, who is going to be, he is a, an author uh, and also writes for wine. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the, what's the most prestigious wine magazine? Wine Spectator. Wine, wine Spectator and also the Oregonian. And uh, his, his name is Alberti and he will uh, be speaking about wines uh, that are, are, are great wines in the um, Willamette Valley. And he'll also be donating a lot of wines for our Wine of Wall. And we'll have our auction as we normally do. Not very many items, only five or six things, but just enough to have fun. And um, we'll have a nice food spread and wine right on the patio there at the Heritage Center on Friday, um, the 8th of September. So come out and support us if you can. Are you still doing tickets plus the 50-50? Or... We'll have a raffle. Yeah, yeah. And okay. we'll be doing, um, we'll be selling the, the the gift cards at face value for a lot of the local businesses and stuff. So it's we'll we'll be selling stuff. We'll be raising money that night. So so your ticket into the event is probably only the beginning of us getting into your wallet. <laughs> okay. All right. Anything else for Ross? Thank you guys for Thanks, supporting Ross. us and to continue um uh your help. Um especially the interfaces we have with the city are, are very rewarding and we enjoy them. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. All right. That brings us to the 12th and planning commission annual report. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I am Steve Cooper, Assistant Community Development Director. I also serve as the liaison for staff to the Tualatin Planning Commission. With me is Janelle Thompson, our Planning Commission Vice Chair, and we're Welcome. here to present the Tualatin Planning Commission Annual Report for 2022. He's probably going to raffle that off. 
On our first slide, we have your planning commissioners, Bill Beer, Beers, our chair, could not be here tonight, but sends his regrets. Janelle Thompson seated next to me, our vice chair, Daniel Bachhuber, who's pictured on the right. And then we have Ursula Kuhn in the picture, Randall Ledick, who is also in the picture, and Zach Wimmer, who's in the picture. Brittany Valley was not in the picture. Um, it's worth noting that 2022 was our first year since the pandemic that we're meeting in person. And so this is our first picture in a long time. And of course, we couldn't have schedules aligned to get a picture at all in 2022 where each person was there. So just a little bit of background. As you all probably know by now, but it's worth repeating that the role of the Planning Commission, first and foremost, is to satisfy Tualatin's responsibilities under Oregon statewide planning goal number one. If you'll remember back to our Planning 101 discussion, that's citizen involvement. And as the goal number one is the most important goal of the statewide planning program, specific to Tualatin, the Tualatin Planning Commission serves as an advisory committee to the City Council on land use matters and a variety of other related matters. They review and make recommendations on comprehensive plan amendments and other such matters. You have one here before you tonight, the Water Master Plan. The Planning Commission also serves as a hearing body making approvals or denials on quasi-judicial land use decisions, conditional use permits, variances, and industrial master plans. 2022 was in some ways a relatively quiet year for the Tualatin Planning Commission. The Planning Commission only made one recommendation to the City Council on the core area investment plan. Uh, that was unanimous seven to zero in favor of the plan, finding it to be in conformance with the Tualatin Community Plan or Comprehensive Plan. And then one sole action item for 2022, the LAM Industrial Master Plan, which facilitated um, changes to LAM's previously approved industrial master plan, allowing them to continue to build out in furtherance of their long-held plans. And although we only had one recommendation, one formal action item, we kept the Planning Commission busy with a lot of interaction, um, discussion, questions, and answered on a variety of different topic areas. Those include the Basalt Creek Employment Zoning Code update, which we'll come back to you later this summer. Um, we had discussion around implementation of the city's housing production strategy and the lead into the equitable housing finance plan. Um, we had some discussions, which um, staff will return to council at some point soon to discuss further to the development code update to meet legal requirements around clear and objective requirements specific to housing and residential development. Um, as I noted earlier, we had early discussions and conversations about the water master plan, which um, in 2023 planning commission made the ultimate recommendation on. And then we had an informal, or excuse me, informational presentation um, from Rich and Ross on the city's parks bond, which was very exciting and informative. And then last but not least, an update on where the city stands in relation to its climate-friendly and equitable communities' responsibilities under those rules. Anything you want to add, Janelle? No, I think that's great. Yeah. And with that, we thank you for your time and are happy to answer any questions that you might have. Questions for Janelle and or I just I wanted to thank you for your contribution to the community, and um, I know without this uh, committee that there's our city council meetings. It's the same one, right, where the city council meetings would go on for a very long time. So I think it's really important work, and it helps. Um, it really helps me um, be more informed on my decision making, and so I just. I know they're not always easy discussions and not always the easiest place to put yourself, insert yourself as in community conversations. There's a lot easier places to do that. So I just wanted to thank you and the rest of the committee for all of your dedication. And thank you, Steve, for your leadership on the, on the committee.
other questions or comments? I, I just echo Council Brooks' uh, thoughts that it, this is a big commitment. This is, you know, this is one of those committees where uh, it's not always a fun thing to be on. Um, it puts you close in line with city council decisions, and we very much validate. Uh, I should say, very much appreciate the opinions that come from the planning commission when we have to make the final decision. Because you know, you guys are putting just as much effort in as we are, uh, but you hear it first. You get to ask all the questions and better inform us when it gets to uh, our decision. I very much appreciate that. Well, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. All right, that brings us to the public hearing for tonight, which is consideration of the 2023 water master plan update, including updated system development charge or SDC methodology and rates and corresponding plan text and map amendments to the Tualatin Comprehensive Plan and Development Code. And this will be Aaron and Nick starting off at least. Yes. <laughs> All right. Welcome. Is this close enough, Nicole? No, closer. Closer. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Got to be in it. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. Good to see you all. Uh, tonight, we're here for you to consider the water master plan and the proposed SDC and rate updates, as the mayor had just uh, identified. I'm joined by Aaron Ingman, senior planner in our planning group, who has helped me through the plan commission process and get the project to this point. Zach Hazel is with FCS. They did the financial analysis for the plan. And then we have John, sex colleague, who's on Zoom if we have questions. And Brian Ginter in the back here with Consor, formerly Murray Smith, who helped with the engineering. So I've got a team of folks here. Hopefully we can address any concerns you have. And we will roll. Uh, here's our agenda for this evening. I hope to just briefly touch on what a master plan is to set the stage for the conversation. I'll roll into an overview of the 2023 plan update that we have before you for consideration. I'll pass it over to Zach for water rate and SDC updates and the methodology and the process and how we got there and what is being proposed. Then I'll kick it over to Erin. She can discuss the comp plan updates and the plan commission meeting that we held earlier. Uh, and then I'll recap some of the public engagement we had with the online open house process recently and then open it up for questions and discussion. So what's a master plan? Briefly, uh, required by law, plans for 20 year planning horizon typically. It looks at the existing system, how it's functioning, what we have, what we need to improve on. It looks at what future growth we're expected to have so we can be ready for that. It identifies capital projects so we know how to strategically invest in the water system, and it determines how we can pay for all that. Uh, that's all rather wonky, but I think behind all of this, water is one of the most important services we deliver. It's crucial for life, uh, economy, well-being, all our residents, everyone depends on it. We take that very seriously. And having a lot of smart minds participate and make sure we're making well-informed and strategic decisions in the water master plan and the water system is really important. This is our roadmap to do that. So this is going to set us up really well to continue to make really good and strategic investments in the water system. So what's in the plan? Uh, I broke it up into four sections. This is kind of how the plan was, was grouped. And it moves from our current situation, where we're at today, what, what we're experiencing, what we have issues with, what we have what we're planning for, what we think is going to happen in the future, particularly around Salt Creek, but we have some infill development opportunities as well. Um, I put a planning bucket. There's a lot of plans that roll up into the plan, so I'll just highlight those briefly. And then funding and rates, which Zach will cover. So current situation. Um, last updated the plan in 2013, not quite 20 years ago, but we've seen some change in both demands and prospective development, and so it seemed very timely for us to take another fresh look at this. We buy water from Portland. That's consideration in how we plan for this. We plan to continue to buy water from Portland. So baking that into the plan and understanding the cost and the infrastructure needs to do that were crucial for this. Uh, just a glimpse of um, what we're looking at today. We're averaging about four and a half million gallons a day on average over the course of the year. And that can jump up to 8.3 in the summer. Typically irrigation drives that up, but just that big swing. And we need to plan for those peak days, even if they're not super frequent. Uh, we have a good mix here. As you know, we have a good, uh, robust tax base. About half of that is commercial industrial. That's <laughs> unique and I think worth pointing out. It's, it's a pretty cool thing that we have here in the city. And um, in general, we just look at all the assets and how they're functioning. So on the right-hand side, there's some snips from the online open house that just show how many pipes, 140 miles of pipes, 
how many pumps, tanks, all of that. I think a lot behind the scenes that not everybody recognizes. And so we and we do an analysis on all that to see what do we need to do, what's not functioning properly today, what needs to be built out. And that gives us a really good baseline to then look at what is coming in the future. Uh, future needs are primarily driven by, I mean, what we look at there is demands and growth. And so the slide here pretty, pretty well focuses on expected water demand increases. Um, at build out, which is um, what we expect to see when all developable land is developed. So they rule out things like floodplain or things that have very steep inclines that aren't likely to be developed. They include things like the Salt Creek Southwest Industrial Area. We look at what we expect to happen given um, trends and what we would anticipate. And we see our average demand going up a little bit, about 1.3 million gallons a day. So that means a pretty big increase for us. Um, but our peak demands, that max day right there, that's what you see. That's a pretty big swing as well. It has us almost doubling in the summer. So that peak demand, even if it's for a couple of days or a couple hours, is what we have to plan for. Um, so you'll see some of that in the CIP projects and the planning. But that is a pretty interesting thing, I think. And as I discussed, increased summer demands, being able to meet those routinely and um, doing that without disruptions is important. Increased resiliency is something that the council has prioritized, staff is definitely interested in, and the community has continued to remind us is very important to them as well. That is baked throughout this plan. Uh, proactive repair and emplacement, we don't want to be caught off guard. We want to get ahead of things. It's more affordable that way and much easier to manage. So that is a foundational um, element of this plan that we have considered. And we want to make sure new development is able to occur and that its funding is available for it to happen. So planning for the plan. Uh, the plan has a bunch of smaller planning documents that roll up into it. Emergency water plan that looks at how we will distribute water around the community during an emergency. So we held workshops with regional stakeholders, county, CERT, fire department, um, community members, businesses, and just looked at where strategically around the city we would want to distribute water, what improvements we would need to make that happen. And that was included in the final recommendation for our CIP projects to make sure that we can have some good distribution points. The water supply strategy was the analysis that we went through to confirm Portland was the good long-term source for us, both financially from source water quality and from council and public's desire. Those two plans were pretty heavy in the public engagement realm, and there was robust engagement outreach for each of those. Those happened over the course of a couple of years. Um, this planning process kicked off in about 2017. And so those earlier plans were well out of the legwork that occurred earlier in the process. Conservation plan is mentioned in here. I will admit it is not very robust. It essentially says we need to develop one in coordination with Portland and that should jive with our new water purchasing contract. So it acknowledges the need, it identifies that staff should work on it, but it kind of punts that to be its own document coordinated with, our, with the city of Portland and the new contract. Uh, seismic hazards and evaluation. It's a very technical document. I do not understand it all, but some engineers went through our city and said, here's what will break when the earth shakes very hard. And we are planning for how to prevent loss of water from the system and how to get back online as quickly as possible. Um, and then that all rolls into the capital improvement plan. What are we gonna actually do to be ready for all this and remain prepared? There are, I believe 54 projects, so I will not, oh. As far as back on the first slide, um, when you were talking about the conservation plan and to develop one in the future in alignment with Portland's, can you just tell me a little bit more about what um, that means? Like what Portland's, does Portland have a conservation plan? They do, Portland does and we do. Uh, just acknowledging being that we buy water from Portland, we wanna try to align ourselves where possible. And we have a new water purchasing contract, which has different incentives and financial ramifications for how we use water. So being mindful of both what Portland's doing as our source and our provider and what our contract requires us to do or incentivizes us to do. So we're not, um, we just want to make sure we have a really holistic look at the best way to conserve water. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so as I was saying, I think there's 54 projects in total. I will not drone through all of them. But some of the more exciting, larger, early projects that I wanted to highlight are the Boone's Ferry Road water main replacement that is underway um, and happening quickly. That both serves the Basalt Creek Autumn Sunrise development, so crucial for that to occur. And it addressed a deficiency that we currently have in our system during the summer with peak demands. So that was one of those deficiencies that we identified in the, in the existing system and then were able to bundle that with a development project. 
um, B level storage and pumping, another storage tank in B level, and another pump up to C level, which would be the most southern part of town, are recommended in the plan at the ASR site. That'll provide us with redundant storage and redundant pumping, something we could definitely use. Um, and it will support all that southern development that we will see. Seismic, seismic improvements, they're just spattered throughout the system, but looking at ways we can keep the water we have on hand after an earthquake and ways we can get the distribution system back online as quickly as possible. So there's a backbone of transmission pipes that we have looked at from the old village insight through the city that we want to invest in first as a priority. And then looking at ways we can keep water in the storage tanks, get water out of our ASR well, that type of stuff, but um, definitely a theme throughout all of the projects upgrade, repair, and replace existing infrastructure. As the asset manager here, this is a big one for me. I like to be on top of that stuff. So looking at ways we can proactively replace assets, doing asset condition uh, and assessments and planning for that. And so we do have a uh, line in the CIP for funding for those proactive pipe replacements. And then the sea level, sea level pump station generator. It's a small one, but we know that area of town has power outages in the Norwood area. Uh, currently we have a mobile, trend, uh, mobile generator that we pull up and, and back and forth and turn on and off and take some staff intervention. So we're gonna put something permanent up there that's automatic. It'll make it much more seamless, uh, require no human intervention to get the power back on and continue pumping. So it's a small project, but it's gonna have a big impact. Can the, I'm gonna ask a question. Please. Seismic improvements, I know this is a little bit off topic, but what's the status of the Washington County supply line? Cause that's, I know it's all, that's Portland's pipe, right? It's a big question. It's uh, Portland, but we don't control it, but that's... We don't control it. There's okay. a shared ownership agreement. It is okay. definitely vulnerable from my understanding. Um, it's like a yes and kind of a step that has to be done with uh, Portland, TVWD, Raleigh are all shared owners. So we need a, a other process for that. So is that part of the... Is part that included in, in the water contract? We are part of... Yeah, that's part of our water contract negotiations. Okay. That's all I wanted to know because yes. they've been talking about years that it's supposed to be improved and doesn't happen. It's a... Uh, the lingering risk we're working on mitigating. Yeah. That pipe breaks, there ain't no water. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, right. that's the, that's where we're looking to address it at. That's got the right stakeholders at the table. Okay. This is specifically within our boundary right. this planning. Okay. Thank but you. But good question. Uh, water rates and STCs. There's a clicker, sir. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so once again, I'm Zach Hazel with FCS Group. I did the uh, rate and STC analysis, and I also have John Gillarducci, the managing principal, in case there's any more detailed strategic questions, uh, he can answer those. Um, so start with the water rates, which is, this is probably review for all of you, but we'll just give you some basics of utility rate making here. So utility rates have to be set only to provide the cost of service and uh, achieving some financial goals. Uh, there are two pr primary types of costs here. In the dark blue color, you have your operating costs in that bar graph there. And those generally rise steadily over the years, although with uh, Portland Water Bureau uh, purchasing costs, um, not, not always so steadily. Um, there are also capital costs in that, uh, that gray color, and those kind of bounce around year to year depending on what needs to be built. Um, here is the capital improvement plan, plan through uh, fiscal year 2032. That's the rate setting period that we're looking at for today. We are at escalated cost looking at $50.3 million in, in those 10 years. Um, you can see some of the costs for some of those big projects there. The B-level transmission upsizing, about $11.8 million. A couple other projects there for $6.8 and $6.7 million. Um, you can see that we have some big costs already right away in the first three years, and we're going to need to make sure that our rates can accommodate that. This, um, this graph does a pretty good job of summarizing all of the rate work that you can read about in our report. So there are two types of data being shown here. The bars are the costs that the utility is facing, and the lines cutting across the bars are the revenues. Um, so let's, starting with the cost, I'll explain each element of this graph. Um, the dark blue at the very bottom, those are your cash operating expenses, not inclusive of the water purchase costs, which are shown in the next bar above um, in the bright blue. Um, you can see that it stays steady until 2027, and then it makes a big jump. Um, and that uh, similar jump occurs again in fiscal year 2030. And we need to start uh, planning for those uh, jumps in water purchase costs. Otherwise, the rate increases would be even more dramatic in those years. Um, after the water purchase costs, the next bar that you can very faintly see if you look closely is the green existing debt service. Um, that kind of starts to fade out uh, over the planning period. 
And then in pink is the new debt service that is related to uh, revenue bonds that we've assumed that you'll issue to help fund the capital improvement program. And then lastly, the last bar that you see here is the yellow bar at the top uh, for rate funded capital. That's what you're setting aside each year um, for, from your rate revenues to help build capital projects. Um, you also have your existing reserves, which are not shown in this graph, because it's an annual graph here. And then um, going to the lines, you can see the line that cuts across all the bars is your rate revenues at existing rates. And what you can see here is that um, we have a little bit of rate funded capital in fiscal year 2023 just passed. Um, pretty much immediately in fiscal year 2024, we start to run into issues. Um, we don't. We wouldn't have any rate funded capital in that year without an increase, and then that those issues only get worse, especially once we see those water purchasing costs uh, occur in 2027. Um, finally, the last uh, line at the top here, the dash line, is the rate revenues with rate increases. Uh, the rate increases are shown in the numbers uh, above that. So we start at 12 percent, which continues all the way through fiscal year 2030, and then after that, we've kind of achieved what we needed to to help fund the. Uh, additional water purchasing costs, and then we can drop back to more uh, inflationary level rate increases. Here, is, here are those rate increases applied to your current rate schedule. Um, you can see 12% all the way through 2030, and then four and a quarter after that. And then lastly, here are some water bill comparisons for a typical single family uh, bill. We're assuming eight CCF of usage. You can see that even though 12% is a high percentage increase, um, in terms of dollar amounts to the typical single family residents, Tualatin is still at the bottom of the pack with relative to these other jurisdictions. So still doing very well, even with that 12% increase. Can I jump in? The proposed and current, the proposed rate increase was adopted on June 26. So that is now our current. So just those are a little outdated. Thanks, Nick. Thanks. All right. Um, assuming there's no questions on rates, the next uh, discussion is about the SDCs. Okay, so um, Oregon law provides very specific uh, rules for how to calculate SDCs. There are two components, the reimbursement fee and the improvement fee. They make up the full system development charge. The reimbursement fee looks at the eligible value of the available capacity that you already have. Um, and we are charging a reimbursement fee to make sure that new development helps to pay for what's already available to them in your system. The improvement fee looks forward at the project list, and in this case, through 2040. Uh, and and figures out the uh, eligible cost of those capacity expanding projects to make sure that development is helping pay for those um, projects that are needed to serve them. So those two elements, once again, make the system development charge. And by the way, the cost of those are divided by the expected growth in system demand through 2040. Here are your current SDCs, um, starting with the 5 eighths inch meter at the very top here, the smallest meter you install. Uh, the charge is $5,566. For every additional meter, of course, they have a higher maximum demand, and so uh, they get a higher uh, share of the SDC costs, and that's why the SDC increases as you get to the larger meter sizes. Can you give an example of what, like, what, what, I mean, I'm assuming it's a manufacturing industrial would have 10-inch versus, what's that your normal house have? That, yeah, lowest one. that would be your 5 eighths by 3 quarter. So the, the, the lowest cost one would be a typical single family home. And what about a tip? So that it looks like the, so a house is at the lowest level, the five eighths by three and a quarter. Yes. So 10 inches was like a manufacturer, somebody, obviously a heavy water user. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Large okay. industrial. Okay. And what sports most of our, what's the average industrial in the 12th? Is it all over the place? Or? I do not know that off the top okay. of my head. I'll just, I'll just, I was just, it's wondering, but so yeah, Pretty much every most residential homes are the first one at that fifty five sixty six, yeah, and that eight, uh, yeah, yes, yeah, sorry, I'm going somewhere else. Yes, yeah. that's the typical single family home impact. For and an apartment. apartment has one water meter for the whole complex, right? Typically, yeah, or maybe you know three or four, depending on how it was developed. Okay. But they would have a, a larger size. Okay, thanks. Like the hospital is like a four inch. A, a four inch, right? So, I mean, even just that, be able to rip even that, that big. Oh, I, I see maybe. Brian nodding. <laughs> oh, perfect. SIPO is a four inch. Okay. okay. LAM is a six inch. SIPA, the Community Partners for Affordable Housing Development, is a four inch proposed meter. 
and Lamb Industrial uh, six. So. Six inch, at least one of their meters. They have more than one. Yeah. So playing out steep is 140, 115 apartments, All right? All right, so um, here are the things we looked at when calculating your SDCs. Uh, like I mentioned, we looked at your growth that come, came from the water master plan through 2040. Uh, we looked at the cost of those capital projects and made sure to discount them to just the capacity increasing portion of those uh, projects um, for inclusion in the SDC. And then we looked at the existing capacity and the original cost for those assets. Um, talking to Brian, um, we identified capacity in the storage, pumping, and transmission uh, functions. Um, so putting all of these pieces together, we calculated the maximum defensible SDC, which is an important uh, set of words there. This is the maximum you could charge. It's not, you're not obligated to charge it. You could charge anything up to the maximum charge I'm about to show you. So here are the proposed SDCs based on those uh, pieces of data I just talked about. Uh, now you can see the starting SDC for the smallest meter is $8,290. And theoretically, if you built a, if you installed a 10 inch meter, it would go all the way up to 953,000. And then this might help a uh, point of comparison here. Um, at the bottom, 12th and current, and I believe, Nick, that the, those are indeed current uh, yep. SDCs. Uh, this is for a single family residence, a five eighths inch meter, you can see 5,566. And then in bold in the middle is the proposed maximum charge. Um, even if you in, uh, took the maximum SDC, um, you would still be in the middle of the pack relative to these comparable jurisdictions. And um, yeah, so you're in a good place either way. And I think that's it. Anything before I pass it over to Aaron? I shook my head, but that's what Brooke. So um, I guess my question is, when, when we look at the bar graph and we see use going up and costs going up, I know that there's capital expenses, but when we look at use expenses, um, how come if there's gonna be more users, the, the line's flat rather than the people that are going to be paying their water bills, or um, whether they're residential or commercial. Does that make sense what I asked? I think so, yeah. Okay. So um, you were talking about how the solid line cut across the... Uh, it's flat, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So first off, I'll point out that the Portland Water Bureau uh, water purchase costs, those are increasing not really as a... I mean, partly as a function of the demand increasing, but also as a... a they're building a big project yeah. in the, um, so the costs are just going up per CCF anyway. Um, secondly, we don't really, we don't really, we look at the demand uh, over the full 2040 uh, planning period and we escalate it on an, an average basis. So we're not, we're not really looking at pricing out every unit of water in every single year. So we're just looking at the average growth of about 1% in terms of uh, water usage. Okay. Thank you. That's Bruce Pratt. I just want an explanation of why Portland is so cheap. They're at the bottom of your list there. I was not yeah. able to find an explanation before this you get meeting. your monthly bills. For... <laughs> I, I have some, some suspicions, but I do not know the answer. That's I was right. not able to find the answer. That's why they still have wooden pipes. <laughs> Plus, we don't, we don't know what these other jurisdictions are doing. So they, they might all be going up. Okay, if we're ready to move on. It's part of the water master plan update. We're also looking at amending some of our planning documents under PTA, which is plan text amendment, and PMA, which is plan map amendment 23-0002. Oops, go forward, not backwards. Um, so specifically, we're looking to update the comprehensive plan to incorporate the water master plan as a supporting document. And with chapter nine, we're going to update it to um, accommodate the new findings from this water master plan. Um, and it also identified three goals, which I'll talk about a little bit more on this next slide. And we're also looking at updating our development code chapter 74 to update a dated reference to our um, comprehensive plan. So as I mentioned, uh, the water master plan has expanded goals and has identified three different goals. Our current comprehensive plan only has one goal, but it kind of bundles up 
many of these ideas into one goal. So we wanted to be clean and to respect what was identified in the water master plan and break it up into three goals. And with these new goals, we've also kind of rearranged and updated our policies to align and support these new goals. So you'll now find that we have 10 policies, whereas before I believe we had six policies. And we're updating um, comprehensive plan map 9-1. So you'll see that this is the existing map. And this is what we're proposing. So as we've studied the impacts to Basalt Creek, you'll notice that the pressure zones have changed slightly. And we are also um, updating the pipe improvements to reflect what's happening on the ground right now as autumn sunrise comes online. And through um, the findings and analysis, which I believe has actually been updated to exhibit three, you'll find that we have analysis and findings to meet statewide planning goals, the Oregon administrative rules, and the Tualatin Development Code. And we've also included information under Exhibit 5 to show that we're meeting our public noticing requirements by the state. And I don't know if, would you like to stop here? I'm gonna turn it over to Commissioner Thompson to talk about the Planning Commission recommendation. Um, okay, they brought this before us. Um, we just had some similar discussions that you guys are having about the rate increase and the sources of the water. Um, a lot of discussions about um, emergency preparedness and kind of where they're standing and some of the work that was gonna be done there to make sure that we could get water in case of emergency. I think a lot of us learned a lot of things too um, as they brought it forward. Um, after all those questions, everybody agreed that it all looked clean to us and accurate. Um, we did think about the rates, of course, I think is a, the difficult part, but I think given the fact that, you know, it's from Portland, it doesn't seem like there's other options that seem more viable financially. So we all approved unanimously the recommendation to adopt the master plan and felt good about it. Any questions? Council Crett. It's not for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was looking through the policies um, um, under goal 9.2, policy 9.22, it's supply development and diversification. It says plan for the development of additional water sources. So that kind of, I guess I want a little more elaboration because, you know, we have to go to the voters if we want anything but bull run water here. And so I just wondered what was meant by that. Um, so what's been identified through this planning process is the potential risk of our water source being 50 miles away through mm -hmm. the pipeline Mayor Fusenick uh, described as being vulnerable. And so one of the things that we have heard consistently through this planning process is having a backup plan is important. And so I think the intention there is to try to understand what viable backup options we have. We're committed to Portland. We're negotiating a 30-year contract. That is something we are fully in on. But what do we do if that gets disrupted? And that might not be an earthquake, that could be pipe maintenance, that could be a construction accident. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into that. So that I believe is what's being captured there. Right, so I think we're just looking to memorialize that there's more work to be done, but we've highlighted that this is identified in the water master plan and it's something that the city recognizes. And that makes sense, that's part of the resiliency yeah. system. Absolutely. Great, thank you. It's just to note the Charter Amendment is not that it has to come from Bull, Bull Mountain, Bull Mountain, Bull Run. Geez, Bull Run. It can't come from the Willamette. It can come from the Platte River. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That could or well. Yeah, it could be, as long as it's not the Willamette, if we have an emergency, we need to get water at a class, which we can't. So we're trying to figure out what all yeah. that could look like for us. What our best option is to just have it's some backup happen. plan to it limit this range. Yep. All right. Back to you, Aaron. All right, and I believe that was my last slide. So I'll move okay. over to public engagement. Thanks. And we got a special guest out of it. I will say the plan commission conversation was really robust. Uh, it was really nice. There was a lot of really good questions. So it was fun. All right, public engagement. Uh, the main component of this was an online open house. So we put together kind of a narrative story map, if you will, uh, as a little bit more rudimentary than that, but essentially trying to walk folks through 
what the planning process entails, how we got here, what we're looking to include and how we're looking to pay for it. And then along the way, gathering feedback from folks about are there values there? Or do we have the right prioritizations and projects and priorities? How does the funding feel? Um, and we got really decent response on that, which was nice and a lot of meaningful feedback and comments. Um, I put on the sides how we advertise these things. So for the online open house, we sent postcards to all the addresses in the city. So everyone, all the apartments, industrial, commercial users, um, shared it out through the chamber and some of our other regional partners or city partners, um, social media, website, newsletter, Twalton Life, and then direct emails to any random group that we knew had interest or might have impacts or might have thoughts. So we really tried to cast a wide net because this does really impact the entire community. And then for the STC outreach, uh, a little bit more formalized because we have legal requirements. So there's some newspaper notifications. And then there's a requirement to send it out to a, uh, I believe it's called an interested parties list. What I ended up doing is just having our building folks pull us, anyone who has pulled permits that might be impacted by SDC increases, which wound up being almost 2,100 people and send it to everyone just so we made sure we didn't miss anybody. Um, so we got a really good netcast and we got some key takeaways. People really understand their water system. They know where it comes from. They know that our water is historically affordable. They like Bull Run. I mean, there was a lot of good, meaningful feedback. Folks are pretty educated on this. So that was really nice because they came in with a good base level. And I think that provided some really substantial comments for us. Resiliency and redundancy are important. We heard a lot of comments around just natural disaster emergency preparation in general, and then less so, but comments to, around the distance from our source. So people are plugged in and then they know what that means if something were to happen. The proposed rates feel reasonable. I use the word reasonable. Um, most of the residents identified as like, yes, happy to pay for this, or customers, I should say. Um, happy to pay for this. We believe in the things you're prioritizing in or like don't love it, but I get it. And I think it's a good investment. So it was really nice to see it was about 70, a little over 70% of people fell into those two positive categories of like, we support this in some fashion. Um, I will know there was a smaller section that said this is difficult to pay for. So I think there's some some stuff to do there. But um, overall, I, I was pleasantly surprised with how receptive folks were once they understood what we were paying for. Support for Portland. Um, yeah, lots of comments about just continue to buy water from Portland. Bull Run is awesome, as you all have heard and echoed. So that was just good and reaffirming our choice to stick that out and continue our contract negotiations. And then to the earlier questions, backup source is, is something that folks have identified. So I feel like a lot of that was captured in the plan. I felt like that represented the goals you saw um, from Aaron's slides, the priorities we included in the CIP. So that was pretty affirming. And then to see the general um, support or understanding of the financial aspects to pay for those things was, was good. I put some quotes up here. I won't read them all to you. Um, they were some of the ones I thought were a little bit more representative of the, the, the majority of the quotes I saw or more pointed. Um, but people seemed, once it was explained to them, to feel like it was reasonable, they were supportive. It seemed to represent what we had been hearing from the community. So it was good affirmation. Uh, third one down was a good back pat for all the folks on the team that just put the online hope, open house together and the, all the engagement materials. And then you can see at the bottom just some concerns around redundancy. So action items, since this was a wandery uh, presentation with a lot of things and some special guests, we've got two ordinances for you. One adopts the master plan and the comp plan amendments. The other one adopts the new SDC methodology that Zach highlighted and the new SDC rates. So that maximum allowable increase or defensible increase, I think is the right term. Um, and then I just included rates on here because it's part of the conversation, but there is no action because that initial first year increase was adopted on June 26th. And then as we do every year in budgeting, that will be reassessed, but um, that forecast is part of the plan. So I wanted to identify it. All right. Anything we haven't addressed yet? Uh, since it's a public hearing, I'm going to do public testimony first and then oh, we'll yeah. get to questions. Absolutely. Yep. Because we always forget this part about the public hearing sometimes. So, slide for it. Uh, so with that, so we have two ordinances tonight, 1476-23, uh, which amends a comprehensive plan, and 1477-23, which adopts the SDC methodology and rates. Uh, so I'm asking anybody in Zoom or in the meeting here right now, who would like to testify in support of these two ordinances? Do I have anyone? Anyone in Zoom? <laughs> All right. Uh, the opposite side of the table, do I have anyone in Zoom or at this meeting tonight 
who would like to testify uh, in opposition of these uh, either ordinance? Still just the consult. All right. With that, okay, that uh, includes the public comment part of this. Councilor Sacco, questions. Um, I have a question about the public engagement um, and the comments received. How many people approximately responded and was the outreach in Spanish as well? Yeah, everything was available in Spanish. Um, the open house was translated. All the materials we put out were bilingual. We had about 300 or so unique visitors. Um, the amount of time folks stayed on dropped off the further through the process they got, but. Other questions, Mr. Gonzalez. So I don't know if this is the right form, but I want to ask, um, was there any outreach done to individual homeowners on what they can do to, to save water? Because the biggest spike, if I understand correctly, based on what you said is, irrigation is the biggest waster. So Tualatin Valley Water, Portland Water Bureau, Hillsborough Water, Clackamas River, they all offer rebates to individual homeowners that install a weather smart controller from the sprinkler heads, the controllers. I'm gonna understand that program, first come, first serve, money runs out. Um, since we are going to be updating our water plan, I would like to include, if possible, with the support of the council, to maybe add some dollars to allow more homeowners to qualify for that rebate, since irrigation is the biggest, one of the biggest wastes of water. We've all seen water running when it's raining all the time. It happens uh, as the season unfolds in the, in the spring and as it goes away in the, in the fall time. People are wondering along when it's raining sometimes. If they had a sensor, a rebate, or even that education around that, um, that can also save the usage of water to our city in the, conceivably. So has there been any work done around that um, to make that program a little bit more robust? We currently offer no rebates. I would um, envision that fitting very well in the water conservation plan and then spinning up a program potentially if that was council's desire to help reduce both what you're describing as well as all the sure. other efficiency potential. Um, we get our water from the Portland Water Bureau, and they themselves do offer rebates Correct. themselves. So because of that, is Tualatin eligible? We would have to do our own program. That's for Portland retail customers only. Okay. So this probably will be a good time to introduce an idea for us, since we are going to be asking for a rate increase. It would be appropriate for us all to try to educate our population here in Tualatin how to use less water in their individual yards for conservation. I think it also plays to our sustainability for our city. Um, to add a robust budget for that potentially. Sure, in the beginning, it can begin with small, but I would see this to be one that would eventually grow with education and resources. Absolutely, totally agree. I will acknowledge that we are part of the water consortium, the Regional Water Pro Providers Consortium, um, and we do distribute outreach engagement materials for water conservation practices. So there's a weekly number for how many inches to water. Sure. That's more of a manual thing. There's some efficiency things that we um, we distribute. So we do do some of that work. I totally agree it could be improved upon. So I'm not assenting on that at all. I just wanted to highlight there is a little bit going on, uh, or plenty of room for opportunity there. Yes, I do tap into that information and share it with HOAs. Um, but I guess if this is the time to vote, I, I don't know when we'll vote on this, but I think um, we should consider at least some ideas for this. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Because uh, going back to my youngster days on council, I remember Councilor Truax bringing up the idea of rebates on the you know the dual button toilets, the low usage toilets, yep. and how we didn't have that kind of rebate program either. So that, in addition, to like the sprinkler thing, all those kind of ideas of yeah, first come, first serve discounts on or voucher for that toilet, you know, that uses less water would be a good idea. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to add to that um, in that group of consideration, I would say the people is it backyard habitat program, mm -hmm. because that's people that are taking their lawns out and they're planting native plants. So I would think that would be a really helpful way to conserve water. Yeah. Thank you. I agree. Other questions? Council Brooks. Well, I'm just going to put you back on all those things that you said. And I think that um, it's really good for our residential community, but also thinking of ideas around commercial since it looks like it's 50-50 and there's a lot of use there. Um, and just thinking about different ways to water and different ways to um, have your entrance way look. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Deliberation, motion. Well, just a second. So, so just to uh, kind of put a bow on that, the 
we we hear your comments on the conservation program, but um, this ordinance does not include right. Right. the conservation program. But that's, we that's will be separate. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. Yep. Thanks, Sherilyn. Yeah, we have to we have to pass both ordinances or adopt both ordinances. Right. So there's ordinance fourteen seventy six dash twenty three which amends the comprehensive plan. And there's ordinance 1477-23, which adopts the SDC methodology and rate. We have to adopt both of those. And it's the first and second reading, you know, all that good stuff. I motion that we have a first reading of ordinance 1476-23 by title only. Second. I have a motion and a second for first reading by title only of ordinance 1476-23. Any discussions on those motions? All right. Uh, Councilor Gonzalez? Yes. Councilor Brooks? Aye. Councilor Sacco? Aye. Councilor Hillier? Aye. Councilor President Pratt? Aye. I vote aye also. Ordinance 1476-23, an ordinance relating to the 2023 Water Master Plan amending Tualatin Comprehensive Plan Chapter 9 and Map 9-1, amending Tualatin Development Code Chapter 74, PTA 23-002, and PMA 23-002. I move that we um, have a second reading of Ordinance 1476-23 by title only. Second. I have a motion and a second for second reading by title only of ordinance 1476-23. Any discussions on those motions? I'll flip it around. Councilor Sacco. Aye. Councilor Hillier. Aye. Councilor Gonzalez. Aye. Councilor Brooks. Aye. Councilor President Pratt. Aye. I vote all aye also. Ordinance 1476-23, an ordinance relating to the 2023 Water Master Plan amending Tualatin Comprehensive Plan Chapter 9 and Map 9-1. One, I would never make a good auctioneer. Uh, amending Tualatin Development Code Chapter 74, PTA 23-002 and PMA 23-0002. I motion that we adopt Ordinance 1476-23. Second. I have a motion and a second for adoption of Ordinance 1476-23 in discussions on those motions. Councilor Gonzalez? Aye. Aye. Councilor Brooks? Aye. Councilor Sacco? Aye. Councilor Hillier? Aye. Councilor President Pratt? Aye. And I vote aye also. It's unanimous. It's adopted. Next slide. I motion that um, we have a reading by title only, first. A, a first reading by title only of Ordinance 1427-23. No, 1477. 1477-23. Can't read my own handwriting. Second. I have a motion and a second for first reading by title only of Ordinance 1477-23. Any discussions on the motions? Councilor Gonzalez? Aye. Councilor Brooks? Aye. Councilor Sacco? Aye. Councilor Hillier? Aye. Councilor President Pratt? Aye. The chair votes aye. Ordinance 1477-23, an ordinance adopting the 2023 Water System Development Charge Methodology amending Tualatin Municipal Code Chapter 2-06 and updating water SDC amounts. I motion for a second reading of Ordinance 1477-23 by title only. Second. I have a motion and a second for second reading of Ordinance 147723 uh, by title only. Any discussion on that motion? Councilor Gonzalez? Aye. Council Brooks? Aye. Councilor Sacco? Aye. Councilor Hillier? Aye. Councilor President Pratt? Aye. Chair votes aye. Ordinance number 1477-23, an ordinance adopting the 2023 Water System Development Charge Methodology, amending Tualatin Municipal Code Chapter 2-06 and updating water SDC amounts. I motion that we adopt Ordinance 1477-23. Second. 
I have a motion and a second for adoption of ordinance 1477-23. Any discussions on the motions? Councilor Sacco? Aye. Council Hillier? Aye. Councilor Gonzalez? Aye. Council Brooks? Aye. Council President Pratt? Aye. And the chair votes aye. It is adopted. It's unanimous. All right. Thank you all. Thanks. That's a lot of talk. All right. That brings us to items removed from consent. Uh, we had no items removed from consent. And that brings us now to council communications and uh, the very patient, Mr. Dragonholt and Pickleball folks. We finally got to your subject. Uh, so the request was made um, to possibly to schedule a work session in the future uh, to look at uh, their request about how it can be possible to get those pickleball courts at the garages. And in order for that to happen, we would have to have four votes from the council to direct uh, Sherilyn to schedule a future work session to discuss it and schedule it with staff. Do we have four votes for that? Yeah. Done. All right, so we will schedule a work session where we will come back and talk to you about what it would entail, mm -hmm. the process for um, allowing pickleball in that zone. Um, along with that, we will bring back a list of, uh, and let you have a discussion about prioritization of the planning department's work plan. Mm -hmm. so, so you can see where that fits in. Right. Thank okay. You. I do have a question for you. Um, the pipeline for this is, I'm not exact, it's weeks, months for the planning. To come back for a work, yeah. in a work session? Yes. Um, we could probably come back in maybe August or the first part of September. Okay. We're in July now. I'm looking at Steve. I'm yes, looking, he's not looking at me either. He's not making eye contact. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm only asking just because we know that you guys have been in support of this and, and it's not that we're not wanting to do this for you. There's just been uh, a huge list of other priorities in the council and, and we are sensitive to your needs as well. So we, I just want to reassure you of that. Thank you very much. So. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, with that, are there any other council communications? That's the President Pratt. I just want to point out that it's summer and we have a lot of events going on in our city and tomorrow's a science spectacular for elementary school kids at the library plaza at one o'clock wednesday is our lunchtime concert series at the um, lake of the commons from 12 to 1 with lisa mann and uh saturday the 22nd of july is viva Tuala 10 and it looks like they still need volunteers so if you'd like um i found the easiest way to find it is just type in viva Tuala 10 and it pops right up so that's it. Anything else? I just want to say an early, I hear you have a big birthday coming up, Mayor. And I just want to say an early happy birthday and acknowledge that. Thank, Thank you. you for your service. All right. I, I move a, to adjourn. I, thank you. Do I have a second? I have a motion, a second to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? It's unanimous. Thank you, everyone. Have a very good night. Recordings.